Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, welcome to our service today again. We've already done that, but I can't say it enough. I appreciate you. I love you. And, um, you know, I pastor the church. All those other pastors wish they pastored because of the quality of people we've got. It's growing. Glory to God. God is filling us up. We receive this place filled to overflowing with those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Glory to God. Jesus is coming. Things are on the move. These are exciting days. You know, I don't know if you know it or not, but uh, my barber is here in the, in the service. Lewis, he's, uh, he, he cuts my hair. It's the reason I look so good. On the other hand, if you don't like the way I look, it's his fault. But, but uh, we always have a good time. Uh, yesterday I got a haircut. We always have a good time uh, fellowshipping around the things of God. And uh, we just, you know, the whole time I'm in the chair, we're bouncing the word off each other. But um, I like something that he said yesterday about change. You know, the, the, the Bible tells us that the Holy Ghost has been given to us as a helper. And he helps us through times of change in our lives. Amen. Amen. We should not fear change. Amen. Change is here to stay. Amen. It's a wrong concept. It's a wrong attitude, a wrong uh, focus to look back to the good old days or to be thinking in terms of if we could just get back to a certain place. There is no going back. You can't go back. All you can do is go forward from here. Time is a one-way street. Are you listening to me? There's not any going back to something. So eradicate that concept. Forget about thinking that way and start thinking, what has God got for me in this season of change? God is helping me navigate the waters. I don't want to go back. I want something better than what was behind. And we can always be shooting for better glory to God. And so let's trust the Holy Ghost to help us navigate the waters, the seas of change. Because there'll always be change. Things are always going to be in flux, in motion. Praise God. That's a good thing. That means you're alive. As long as things are changing, that's a good sign you're alive. If they're not changing, check your heartbeat, check your pulse. You're already gone. Change is here to stay. Can you say amen? amen? Let's trust the Holy Ghost this morning. Now, you know, as I was praying about this service, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to just uh, leave the things behind uh, that God has spoken to us to stay focused on. So, you know, we, we teach on things and we share things with you. And a lot of times the, 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 a word will come and then we'll rejoice about it momentarily and then move on from that. Now God's Word is one thing that does not change. And so that's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So there's no change there. But a lot of times we'll inadvertently, unintentionally sometimes move on and forget the things that have been said to us. I just want to bring some things to your remembrance real quickly that God has spoken to us this year. Number one, He said some things through Jerry Savelle to us. You remember what they were? that we are to continue to believe for the maximum potential. Amen. What else was it? The highest level of attainable. That's right. So we want to, we want to keep our, our focus high. We want to keep our vision hot. Glory to God. And don't let circumstances cause you to get the mully grubs. Your vision is what God said that He would fulfill in your life. So keep that vision hot. Now another thing that the Lord said to us beginning of this year was plant flowers. That's right. We want to harvest, plant flowers. We used a little cartoon that I found online somewhere and it said, a little cartoon character, one of them said, you know, I, uh, uh, I just don't know what 2023 is going to hold. I'm, I'm, things are so uncertain and everything in so much turmoil and uh, I, don't, I don't know what to expect. And the other little guy, a little cartoon character said, well, I'm expecting flowers. He said, yeah, why do you say that? And he said, because I'm planting flowers. Amen. And so we're going we're gonna to receive in our lives and in this year the things that we're planting. Amen. Continue to plant. Amen. Continue to sow. 
the things that you desire, glory to God. Continue to sow the words, continue to sow the love, continue to sow the finances, continue to sow the, the encouragement to others, and you will yourself be encouraged. And then another thing that the Lord said, might have been last year, but we've been walking in the light of this, and that is stay filled or stay full and stay out of God's way. Amen. Stay full, full of what? Full of the Word, full of the Spirit, and stay out of God's way because God is working. So let's keep those things on the front burner. Keep those concepts, those ideas, really they're all three things are, the same, are, are different ways of saying the same thing and pointing us in the same direction. The, the point is, let's keep our eyes on Jehovah Jireh. Amen. He is our source. He is the God who is more than enough. And when the government runs out of money, you don't have to worry because Jehovah Jireh will not run out of your supply. Amen. When, when this thing runs out or when that thing runs out, don't worry. Jehovah Jireh has an unending supply. Can you say amen? All right. Glory to God. Now, open your Bibles with me today to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. And this is what we're going to share with you today. Once again, we're continuing. I'm kind of loosely continuing in a, I don't know if you'd call it a series or not. It's just the flow that I'm in. I was greatly impressed when I was at Paris Island, South Carolina for a Marine Corps graduation a number of months ago. And uh, the theme uh, on Paris Island is we make Marines. Well, I came back and I sensed the Spirit of God speaking to me saying, we build believers. And so everything I've been doing has kind of been loosely you know, orbiting that idea, building believers. That's the job of the church. Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want to be a part of something that the gates of hell are not prevailing against. The institutions that I see, the, <clears throat> the man-made organizations and, and think tanks and all that, I see the gates of hell prevailing against many of them. But Jesus said, the church is that, that is the church that Jesus builds, is that which the gates of hell will not prevail against. Well, that's what I want to be a part of. And so we're building the church. And in building the church, that part and parcel of that is building the believers, building us corporately, building us individually, and letting God enlarge us from the inside out. Every good thing in your life, child of God, is not going to come from the outside. It's going to come from the inside. Proverbs chapter 3 tells us, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. You know, that's a military concept, a military term. Because when you join any branch of the military service, you may be a Marine, you may be a, 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 an Air Force, uh, you know, part of the Air Force, you may be part of the Army, you may be part of the Navy, it doesn't make any difference. One thing you bear in common is that you are all, always going to be a GI. GI stands for government issue. And that is simply a reference to the fact that when a person joins the military, everything they need is issued to them from the government through that branch of the military service. Amen. God says, <clears throat> guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. When you join the family of God, and you really do more than join, you are born into the family of God, born again. When you're born into the family of God, everything that you need, everything that God supplies in your life is going to come out of your inward man. And that's what the scripture means when it says work out your own salvation through in fear and trembling. It's not talking about work to be saved. It's talking about take that what's on the inside and work it out and practice and, 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 and get proficient at living in the reality of it in the natural realm. Amen. Glory to God. And so out of your heart are going to come the issues of life. Everything you need to eat, everything you need to wear, every place you need to live, every spiritual blessing, every piece of wisdom, every concept, every idea, every inspired, uh, creative thought is going to come out of you, uh, out of the inward man, where, because that's where the Spirit of God lives. And so the past couple of weeks that I've been sharing with you, we've been talking, putting an emphasis on the Holy Spirit and His work in our life. Praise God. 
By the way, uh, congratulations, or maybe I should say thank you to the ladies that were at the meeting yesterday and particularly those that spoke. I heard it was a great uh, pillars meeting and uh, it was uh, greatly received. And so good job, guys. Y'all did a great job. Now we're going to begin reading here in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. Everybody say Ephesians 6, 10. Now, underline this if you don't have this in your Bible, particularly this first word, finally. Finally. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Finally, my brethren. Now, you know, I saw this, uh, the Lord showed this to me years ago as, as I read this. That word finally had a great significance because Paul's writing these letters inspired by the Spirit of God, but just as, as a natural way of of, uh, composing a letter. If you are writing a letter to somebody and giving them pertinent information and important information, you're going to, generally speaking, save the best for last. You may start out with it, but then you're going to punch it again and emphasize it at at the end because the reality of it is that much of the time the last thing that you hear or the last thing that you read is what you remember the most. And so when he said finally, what he's doing here is, he's not just saying, well, I'm wrapping it up. He's saying, this is the most important part. Finally, my brethren. As a matter of fact, the Passion Translation reads that way. This is what the Passion Translation says. Finally, or I have saved these most important things for last. Most important. Everybody say most important. important. All right, this is most important. Now, Ephesians is a powerful letter. It's a very important letter. It is considered by some to be the holy of holies of the New Testament because there's so much in it that tells us who we are and what we have in Christ. It, it, is, it is a lofty, lofty ideal. It tells us that we're seated together in heavenly places in Christ. So this is the whole letter is packed full of important and revelatory information. And yet he says in verse 10, I have saved these most important things for last. What are these most important things, Paul? Well, let's keep on reading. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Verse 13, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Now as we unpack this, we see here that there's a lot of things that he's saying here. Not only are these the most important things, but what are these most important things? Be strong in the Lord. Or again, the Passion Translation says, be supernaturally infused with strength through your union with the Lord Jesus. I like that. Be supernaturally infused with strength. God, I'm happy to report, doesn't expect us to just suck it up and be as strong as we can in ourselves. He offers an infusing of strength through our union with the Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, out of our belly flows these rivers of living water. This, of course, is speaking of this divine connection that we have by virtue of the indwelling Holy Spirit. He has restored life. He has restored authority. He has restored the things that Adam lost. And now then, we are expected to learn of these things and walk them out in our daily life. Be supernaturally infused with strength through your union with the Lord Jesus. Verse 11 says, put on. Put on. Everybody say, put on. Put on. Now, this word put on, and that's what it is. It, the Greek actually uses, uh, uh, translates that way, put on. It's just like <clears throat> Jesus uh, used this same word <clears throat> back in uh, Matthew chapter 6 when he's talking to the disciples about don't worry and don't take the care of the things. He said, take no worried thought about the, the things that you put on, your raiment, clothing. You put it on. It's something that you, you get up in the morning and you go to your closet and you make the choice about what you're going to put on that day. Now you may consult your wife or your husband as the case may be. 
I frequently have consulted my wife over the years. However, I, I'm happy to report that I have arrived and I'm, I, am now, I am now quite the fashion guru. But I didn't start out that way. She, uh, she had to coach me and help me. But I'd go into the closet each day and I would, I would decide what I was going to put on. I went in this morning to decide which suit am I going to wear. Praise God. I think it's important to dress for the occasion, don't you? Amen. That's the reason when you see me in the pulpit, you always see me dressed up. Amen. I don't care what everybody else does. But I have too much respect and honor for the Lord to, to dumb it down in the pulpit. I don't care what you do. I don't care what other preachers do. But you're always going to see me in a coat and a tie in the service, all things being equal, unless there's some unusual circumstance or something like that. So uh, I think you ought to dress for the occasion. And you know, there's another old saying that says, clothes make the man. Now, at one time, I didn't have any fashion sense at all. I was a blue jean and t-shirt guy. But then I got saved, and I, I recognized, you know, when I got saved in the Assembly of God church, and, and I saw the way that others dressed, I took my cues from that. I realized, you know, this is, this is a place of honor. And so I need, to, I need to consider that. I need to be considered of the Lord. I need to, I just want to put my best foot forward. But in those days, I didn't have any fashion sense. I didn't really understand. I, got, I inherited that from my dad. My dad, bless him, in heaven, he's in our future. But that man did not know how to dress. I don't know how much interaction there was between him and my mother, but I can remember him wearing like striped pants and a checkered coat. It just, it was a, it was a train wreck. And I guess I inherited that from him. So uh, I had to learn it. My wife helped teach me. I think there's a lot to that expression, clothes make the man, you know. Now then they've got websites that can help you and show you what color shoes to wear, what color slacks and suits and whatnot. But there's help, help available out there. But here's God telling us how to dress. How to dress for what? How to dress for the battle. How to dress for life. How to dress for victory. Glory to God. Be strong in the Lord. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 12 is a situa situational awareness scripture. He's telling us something here that you would not know otherwise. Satan keeps this part of life darkened to the human race. But we are wrestling against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world and against wicked spirits in heavenly places. They're everywhere and their influence is constant. It is continual. <clears throat> now, doesn't mean every, everybody has to yield to it, but they're always pushing. They're always trying to influence you. They may not be trying to influence you personally. You may not have a devil on your shoulder whispering into your ear, but you got one coming out of the television. Amen. You got one on the radio. You got one at the newsstand. Amen. You got many of them on the internet. Are y'all here? Amen. These demonic powers are doing their best to influence all of us, influence mankind, and they've got a lot of practice at it, and they are very, very good, very, very good at this. So he tells us to put on this armor so that we'll be able to stand against their wiles. Now, putting this armor on is doable. He wouldn't tell you to do it if you couldn't do it. So you can do this, but it takes a conscious decision. I didn't just walk into my closet blindfolded and walk out fully clothed. The clothes didn't jump on my back. I put them on. Are you here or not? You have to put these things on. You have to intentionally decide, this is what I'm going to wear today. Now, like Brother Hugh was talking about double time. He's right. I never told everybody to stop double timing. Amen. This, he's going back now 10, 12 years ago where we were spent some time talking about double time. Yeah, that's right. Amen. It's double time. Amen. Amen. I said it's Amen. double time. Amen. Now that has a number of meanings, but one of them is God wants to double you. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. 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 I'm all about doubling. That's God's way of increasing, double time, Amen. praise God. I have a brand, uh, a cattle brand, registered in the state of Kansas, and it's a, 
It's two horseshoes welded together. It's called the double U. And that's where I get that from because I see in the scripture, God gave Job twice as much when he prayed for his friends. Isaiah said, for your shame, I will give you double. It's double time. Payday. Glory to God. So um, we have to intentionally wear these clothes. We have to intentionally put these things on and present ourselves this way. They put a robe on Jesus at the trial, a purple robe, and mocked him so that you could throw off your clothes of mockery and shame and put on the whole armor of God. Jesus has bought this suit for you. I said, he's bought this suit for you. You should wear it. I've told you before the times that I'd buy Brother Hagin's suits, you know, when uh, Father's Day would come along or his birthday and he'd always wear them. And he'd tell me, he said, I, I'm gonna wear it at camp meeting for the first time I'll wear it at camp meeting and I'll show it to you when you come. So I'd go out there and he'd, he'd show me, he said, this is that suit you bought me, Doc. Well, see, I paid for it. I wanted him to wear it. I don't want this thing hanging in this closet. Jesus paid for this. He bought this suit for you. He doesn't want this hanging in your closet. Are y'all here? It, it's, not, it's, not, it, it's not arrogance. It's not pride. It, it's, it's, not, it's, it, it's nothing negative about wearing this clothing. This is something that he bought and paid for. So you could put it on. And he said, put it on. Put on the whole armor of God. Glory to God. And don't take it off. Don't worry, it's self-cleaning. <laughs> You're washed every day by the washing of the water of the Word. All the B.O.'s gone. All the stains are gone. It's new. His mercies are new every morning. Praise God. Keep it on. Keep it on. Say, keep it on. Keep it on. This is a situational awareness scripture, verse 12, telling us who we wrestle against, where our real battle is. Your battle is not in some geographic location in this state or this nation. Your battle, your enemy is not living in a house somewhere made out of hands. Your enemies are these demonic powers that entrench themselves and rule and reign from an unseen position of influence and authority. Can you say amen? amen. And so be situationally aware about this. Now, when it says put on these things, I want you to understand too the context of this. What is the book of Ephesians about? Well, you stop and go back and look at it from chapter one on. It's about redemption. It's about possessing our inheritance. It's about ruling and reigning, seated in heavenly places in Christ. It's about knowing God's love. It's about walking in love with your spouse, with your children, with your, those that you work with, those that you interact with. And in these situations, this is where he says, I'm saving the most important thing for last. Put on this armor. Put on this clothing. Glory to God. And then he repeats it in verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, stand. Notice, whole armor. He said it in verse, uh, uh, verse uh, 11 and verse 13. The whole armor. The whole armor. You know, Sometimes it's easy to kind of go business casual in this. Take off a certain piece of it, but every piece is important. I said every piece is important. Just like, you know, modern, moder the modern church, uh, the, 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 I don't know if it's average, but many out there in the church world, many ministers, they, they like to preach without a tie. And that, or they like to preach in blue jeans or something like that. Well, they may still be technically wearing a coat, but... They've taken something off. They're just partially dressed, in my opinion. Thank you for your enthusiasm. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about me. All right? But uh, we see here that he says the whole armor. Don't leave any, any of these pieces uh, in the closet. Don't, don't leave home without any of these things. So let's take it apart and look at it and see what it says. But the, here, here's another thing, too. Verse 13 of, um, let, me, let me read this to you out of the Passion Translation. Or if you got it up there, 
Can you give me the Passion Translation in Ephesians 6, 13? Glory to God. It brings out a particular point. Because of this, you must wear all the armor that God provides you so you're protected as you confront the slanderer. For you are destined for all things and will rise victorious. You are destined for all things and will rise victorious when you're, when you're dressed for the occasion. Dressed for success is what Ephesians 6 is all about. So let's look at these things and understand that we need every piece of this armor. First of all, verse 14. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now he compares this outerwear to a uh, Roman soldier's uh, battle gear, all right? And the Roman Empire was the most techni technologically advanced army uh, military force of its day. And they crushed their opposition. And so Paul likened these things to the, the Roman battle gear. But how many of you know that if he'd lived today, he would have used something far more technologically advanced and far superior than what they had in those days. And so it's not a stretch for us to do it because the technology that he's referencing was known to man, but God was already technologically advanced. So he tells us our loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. I want you to envision, if you will, the modern special operator or the modern special forces soldier in his battle gear. He doesn't have on like a, just a, 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 you know, a shiny metal Roman breastplate with a eagle carved into it or hammered into it. This guy is wearing Kevlar armor with armor plates on the inside. So not only will it stop an arrow, it'll stop a rifle bullet. And he's wearing it front and back. He puts this vest on, this, this uh, uh, body armor on, and it extends all the way down. It doesn't just stop right here. This, this loins girt about with truth, this is really part and parcel of the same piece of equipment. It wraps around you here. It protects 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 you here. You are protected because you're covered by the blood. Breastplate of righteousness. This is the righteousness of God that Jesus has purchased for you and me. This is the fact that we stand righteous before God and what is the significance of that? That it doesn't matter what the devil says. Remember again, I think the Passion Translation mentioned the fact that we are dealing with the accuser of the brethren. Now here's where we get tripped up. So often we'll let him accuse us without responding. Rather, we'll take the accusation, internalize it, and become depressed over it. Because, hey, you missed it. Hey, you blew it. Hey, you made a misstep back there, and it's caused all your steps since then to be off track. No! I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm right with God. Go back to the devil. Uh, go back to the Bible, devil. And look at all the times that those that were in covenant with God made false steps, made mistakes, did the wrong thing, and God just turned it around on the enemy, and God made it work for them for good. Glory to God. And how much more do I, as the dwelling place, the temple of the Holy Ghost, with His righteousness and His glory in me, how much more do all things work together for my good? Because I love God and I'm called according to His purpose. Don't let the devil beat you up over your mistakes. Don't let the accuser of the brethren run you through the mud because of something that happened. Whatever happened is behind you. Look ahead, glory to God. Victory is what you are destined for. Loins girt about with truth. What is truth? Ah, that's an easy one. God's word is truth. That's what Jesus said. That's the words of Jesus. Sanctify them through, their, through your, thy truth, Father, Jesus prayed. Thy word is truth. God's word is 
true. What do we do when God's Word says this and the experts say that? We go with the truth. Always remember this. God made the ark. Experts made the Titanic. The ark didn't sink. And your ark's not going to sink because you are destined for victory. So loins girt about with truth. Always putting the truth of God's Word ahead of what's convenient, ahead of what's fashionable, ahead of what's culturally accepted. God's Word is truth. And bless God, when you're walking in truth, you are right. You're righteous. Amen. Notice the, the next one, verse 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now this is a very important part of your gear because in battle <clears throat> your footwear is probably as important as anything else. You know, uh, your feet take a beating. And no matter how much armament you got, no matter how much firepower you're carrying, your feet are what's going to get you there. And you're walking over hill and over dale and over every dusty trail. Well, you need the right kind of footwear. What is this footwear, Holy Ghost? What is this footwear that you're speaking to Paul about? Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. Everybody say the gospel. The gospel. Now, here's why knowing the Word is so important. Because what some people call the gospel is not the gospel at all. Amen. There is one gospel. One gospel and one gospel only. And what is that gospel? Paul said it like this. Romans chapter 10, the word of faith which we preach. Amen. Now let me show you something else that he emphasized that regarding. Go with me back to the book of Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. He said, I marvel that you were so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. I always get amused, although it's not amusing, it's kind of sad. It just shows the, the, the deviousness of the powers of darkness and how susceptible even Christians are to them. But when they start criticizing the message of faith and the message of redemption and calling it another gospel, it shows the darkness in people's minds and their understanding because all we're preaching is what Paul preached. The Bible says over in the 14th chapter of the book of Acts that there in the cities of Derby and Lystra, he, Paul, preached the gospel. And it was there that he observed a man who was crippled from his mother's womb. And he, he, he looked intently on Paul as Paul was preaching. And Paul looked intently on him and saw that he had faith to be healed. Amen. Now let me tell you something. There is no way that that man or any other man will ever have faith to be healed. On this watered down, Jesus doesn't heal. Healing is passed away. Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. You can't never tell. You might get lucky. There's no way that he would have ever had faith to be healed on anything other than the gospel that Paul preached throughout the New Testament. Are you here or not? The word of faith, Paul called the gospel. The word of faith which we preach. Now notice, read on here. We're in Galatians chapter 1. I marvel you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ and to another gospel, which is not another but there be some that trouble you and that would pervert the gospel of Christ. So the gospel of Christ can definitely be perverted. But then he says this, this is powerful, man. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than you have received, let him be accursed. A curse. Paul put a curse. He declared a curse for the person who preaches any gospel differently than he preached it. He called it in Philippians chapter, um, let's see, where is it? Romans chapter 1, verse 16. 
He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto everyone for salvation, to the Jew first, then also to the Greek. The power of God. Listen, if the gospel is not preached in power, it's not the gospel. If power is not being preached, then it's not the gospel. Are you here? Paul said in Romans, in Romans chapter 2, verse 16, I believe it was, he called it my gospel. He took ownership. Well, brother, let me tell you something. This gospel of redemption, this gospel of faith, this is my gospel. This is what I've walked in. This is what I've lived in for the past 50 years. And glory to God, it works. It works. It works. Because it causes me to always come out victorious. Now, in order to come out victorious, you've got to go through some stuff. But that's all right. As long as you come out with that victory. So it's important that your feet are shod with the proper footwear. Soldiers, once they've been through, you know, some training and all that and learn how important their feet are, oh, they can, they, they spare no expense where their boots are concerned. They prioritize the right kind of footwear. So should you. Be sure that the gospel you're listening to, the gospel you're walking in, the gospel that you have embraced as your own, be sure that it's sure-footed gospel. Be sure that it's got tread on the bottom. And it's not slippery slick. Are you here? Because you need something that'll hold on, that'll purchase. Amen. Now the Roman shoes, of course, of that day, they weren't the Roman sandals like you're commonly accustomed to seeing in that, you know, in period pieces where they're wearing the robes and the open-toed sandals. The Roman boots, they were armor plated. They had tread and actually spikes on the bottom that would dig in and you couldn't, you know, couldn't kick somebody's leg out from under them. And then the toes, they were protected. They were armored. So this is the kind of footwear that he's talking about here. Go with me back over to Ephesians 6. What does he say next? Verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith. There's our faith again. Wherewith you shall be able to quench every fiery dart of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, the shield of faith, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is talking here about armored protection. Now, anymore, soldiers don't carry shields into the battle like they did before. All they were facing was spears and swords and, you know, arrows and things like that. So, a shield that you wore here could be protection and hand-to-hand -hand combat. They don't, they, don't, they don't fight like that anymore. What they do now is they go in armored personnel carriers. They go, they go behind heavy armor. That's what the shield of faith is. It's not just something that you just carry around. You might drop, might get it knocked out of your hand. You are armored, my brother. You are, you're in a tank. You're in an armored carrier. It's taking you where you want to go, and they can shoot at you, and they can throw at you, and they can, they can set off, you know, they can plant mines in front of you. But when you've got this shield of faith, I like to describe it like this. I like to even go a step beyond in technology. Don't think of it just as steel plating. Think of it as a force field. That's a better, that's a better illustration of it. You remember on the Enterprise when they'd come under attack? Captain Kirk would say, raise shields. And there would be this invisible energy field around them that would stop whatever was trying to get through. That's the way the shield of faith is. It's an energy, it's an aura, it's an energy shield around you. It's real. It's sometimes visible. It's sometimes tangible. This, this anointing, this power of God on you can sometimes be seen, but it can always be effective. Amen. Glory to God, whether you can see it or not. So take the shield of faith and, again, these are above alls, and the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, this helmet of salvation, forget about the little Roman metal thing. Start thinking the helmets that they wear today. Any of y'all ever watch the Navy SEAL movies, the Special Forces movies, where they wear in the helmets and they got all the, the, the uh, different nods on them, where they can flip those things down, then they can see in the dark. They can see thermal, they can, they can paint infrared. Hey, listen, man, our technology is so advanced, the devil have, doesn't have anything to, to match it. He doesn't have anything to, to oppose it. God will help you see in the dark. 
God will show you where the things are hidden. God will show you where the enemies are. Keep that helmet on. Keep that helmet on. The helmet of salvation. The renewed mind. Keep renewing your mind to the Word of God and you'll see the unseen and you'll know the unknown. Glory to God. And the devil won't be able to walk you into a, a minefield unawares. But you'll know in advance where the traps are set. Above all, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit. Now, again, sword was the most advanced thing that they had in those days. But that's all right. It'll still work. Just understand this. What he's talking about here is the spoken Word of God. This word, Word, in verse 17 is the word rhema. And rhema is different than logos. Logos is the living Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, the logos. And the logos was made flesh. And the logos was God. Are you here? And so this is a description of Jesus in His totality. But the rhema is the Word of God spoken. You could say it like this, it's the written Word of God spoken. And Paul calls this the sword of the Spirit. It is that which slices and dices. It is that which cuts bonds, which, the, which severs chains. Glory to God. It is that which will cut through steel bars of a prison cell. Glory to God. Amen. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. To show you how, how important, powerful, and impressive this is, you remember what the Scripture says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. In the beginning, verse 1 says, God created, I'm sorry, in the beginning, no, no, excuse me, I'm back and forth. Just give me verse 3. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. Notice what this says. Hebrews 11, 3. I'll tell you what it says. And we know that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. That word, Word, is the word rhema, the spoken Word of God. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the spoken Word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now, I, I received the other day a, a, a link to a video. We've been in contact with a, a dear friend of mine. I haven't seen him in a long time, but I found out that his wife had been, had had, had a, a, a medical problem. And so I called him, Lynn Mink. How many of y'all remember Lynn? Yes. Okay. Many, many of you do, some of you may not. But Lynn, uh, great guy, man. He, we, go, we go way back. He traveled with Brother Hagin for, I mean, Brother Copeland for many, many years doing his praise and worship, all his crusades. And uh, he and his wife Kathy were very, they had a, a, a program on the Oasis Network out in Tulsa uh, called The Road Show, I believe it was. And I was interviewed a number of times by them on the radio program, a live interview, because I was one of the broadcasters out there for a long time. Well, anyway, got in touch with Lynn. He's a, he, he, a super guy. He's Jewish, but he's born again, and uh, ex-Navy corpsman, uh, ex, uh, you know, I mean, loves to ride motorcycles. We've ridden motorcycles together. Just a, just a good guy. We took this prayer request for his wife to the prayer group, and then Phyllis got a, a link to a video from one of the prayers. And I went and looked that up and, read, and, and saw this. And what it was was a prophecy that Lynn received from the Lord. And he was sharing it on one of their programs. And in this, now the, the, the prophecy was a little bit lengthy. But the part that I want to get to was this. He said he was sitting, he was having a very, very deep time with the Lord one day. In his, in his, he was sitting in his chair and he felt the wind blow. And it was like the doors blew open and the curtains began to move spiritually, not literally, but it, was, it had that kind of an impact. And he said the Spirit of God began to speak to him. And among other things, here's what he said. I turn words into worlds. Man, when I saw that, I thought, that is good. The only thing that surprises me is that I hadn't seen that before. 
Why didn't I say that? I turn words into worlds. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the spoken word of God. God will take your words and build world, worlds out of them. You don't like the world you're living in? Change what you're saying. Because God turns words into worlds. Glory to God. I said glory to God. I said glory to God. Say it out loud. God turns words into worlds. We can frame our own worlds by the Word of God. I'm not talking about planets. I'm talking about the world we live in, our circumstances, our, our way of living. The Holy Ghost turns word, words into worlds. Glory to God. And so then in verse 18, he tells us where to use these words. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Praying that utterance may give, be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Yes. Paul said, pray for me and pray for everybody else <laughs> and everything else. But our words uttered in prayer, Holy Ghost will take our words and turn them into new worlds. Yes. Mm, glory. He did it for God. He did it for the Lord Jesus. And He'll do it for you because it's the Word that He performs, not the man. I said it's the Word that the man speaks, not the man. Not the intents of the man. Not the well meaningness of the man. But the words of God that a man speaks. So we declare victory. We declare victory, financial victory over each one of you and your families. Financial victory over you and your loved ones. We declare healing victory over you. We declare strength and wisdom to know the next step that you're supposed to take. Glory to God. In the name of Jesus.